Horn, author of Fatherless America. About books, Saturday and Sunday nights on C-SPAN 2. Next, a House subcommittee report on the Waco investigation. The report reviews the actions of federal agencies during the standoff with Branch Davidians in late 1992 and early 1993. New Hampshire Congressman Bill Zeliff chairs the half-hour meeting. Hey, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. Right in there. Good morning. Subcommittee on National Security, International Affairs, and Criminal Justice will now come to order. Today we meet to vote on the report of the investigation into the activities of federal law enforcement agencies toward the Branch Davidians. This report concludes a year-long study of the events that took place at Waco, Texas. The Subcommittee on National Security, jointly with the Subcommittee on, the crime, of, uh, on crime of the uh, Committee on the Judiciary, held 10 days of hearings uh, that included almost 100 witnesses. There is no more exhaustive record of what happened at Waco than the transcripts of these hearings. With little cooperation from the executive branch, we attempted to gather the facts surrounding this tragedy. The staffs of the subcommittees reviewed thousands and thousands of documents and spoke with numerous witnesses uh, to the events at Waco and a wide array of experts in the law enforcement arena. We've compiled these facts in this report and have made findings of fact where appropriate and recommendations for law enforcement reform when we thought it would be constructive. Let me highlight some of the major findings and recommendations we have made, but let me also say that I congratulate uh, the agencies themselves because uh, they, without exception, have moved forward and already implemented very major changes. And I just speak to Louis Free, the FBI, uh, and I wrote him after Montana. The things that were learned at uh, Ruby Ridge and Waco obviously were put into action and. Uh, we had a, a very successful outcome in Mont on Montana, so we thank him for his leadership. Among our foremost conclusions are the following. But for the criminal conduct and aberrational behavior of David Koresh and other Branch Davidians, the tragedies that occurred in Waco would not have occurred. There is clear evidence that David Koresh was violating the law. He had sexual relations with minors and stockpiled weapons. There can be little question that Koresh was a re religious zealot who had enormous control over his followers. He could have ended the siege whenever he wanted to. Another important conclusion is that, while not dispositive, the evidence presented to the subcommittees indicates that some of the Davidians intentionally, at least may have intentionally, set the fires inside the Davidian residence. Three fires in, in three different places on two different floors started within two minutes inside the residence. Had panic caused the Davidians to inadvertently overturn lighted lanterns, it would more likely have occurred at 6 a.m. when the gassing began rather than six hours later. And if one of the military vehicles jarred the building so as to overturn a lighted lantern, the flare would have shown the fire beginning while the vehicle was close to the building. Nothing like that was on the flare tapes. As the Department of Treasury, the report concludes that Treasury Secretary Lloyd Benson and Deputy Secretary Roger Altman failed in their duties by not even meeting with the director of the ATF in the month or so that they were in office prior to the February 28th raid on the Davidians' residence. By not requesting any briefing on ATF operations during this time, uh, we feel that uh, it, was, it was irresponsible. And by not involving themselves with the activities of ATF, um, it was rather amazing. Uh, it's, a, it's further amazing that neither Benson or uh, Altman met with ATF Director Stephen Higgins during the entire month that they were in office. That was a major problem. Benson testified before the subcommittees that he was in London at the time of the raid discussing monetary exchange rates and some other very serious subjects at the time of the raid. This kind of disconnect is, again, irresponsible and unacceptable. While the ATF had probable cause to obtain the arrest warrant for David Koresh and the search warrant for the Branch Davidian residents, the affidavit filed in support of the warrants contained an incredible number of false statements. The ATF agents responsible for preparing the affidavits knew or should have known that many of the statements were false. Probable cause existed due to hand grenade shipments, reports of explosions on the property, and reports of automatic weapons fire on the property. 
The real problem with the affidavit was that the information was stale, irrelevant, and in many cases just downright wrong and dishonest. In making the decision not to arrest Koresh outside the compound, ATF agents exercised extremely poor judgment, made erroneous assumptions, and ignored the foreseeable perils of their course of action. The ATF refused an offer from Koresh to inspect his home. Many during surveillance of the residents did not even know what Koresh looked like. Testimony during the hearing established a pattern of Koresh leaving the residence. ATF could have avoided this tragedy by taking the simple step of catching Koresh outside his home. ATF agents misrepresented to the Defense Department officials that the Branch Davidians were involved in illegal drug manufacturing. Because of its deception, the ATF was able to obtain trading without having to reimburse the Defense Department as otherwise would have been required had no drug nexus been alleged. When ATF first requested military assistance, no drug use at the residence was alleged. The ATF mentioned drug production by the Branch Davidians only after learning that military assistance could be provided without the need for a reimbursement. The information to create the drug nexus relied on stale information from a disgruntled formal David former Davidian. And this really gets to me uh, and gets to the heart of some of the misuse of some of our precious assets. Um, precious money used to fight the drug war or the war on drugs that this subcommittee has spent so much of its energy protecting was used to take down a drug lab that frankly didn't exist and the evidence shows that the ATF knew it. Perhaps the saddest conclusion that we were forced to come up to is this. The senior ATA, ATF raid commanders, uh, Philip Winoski and Chuck Sarabin, either knew or should have known that the Davidians had become aware of the impending raid and were likely to resist with deadly force. The ATF undercover agent, Robert Rodriguez, who was with Koresh uh, on the morning of February 28th, called Sarabin from the undercover house and told him that Koresh knew that law enforcement was on its way to the residence. Sarabin told Winoski what Rodriguez had said, but also that Sarabin had questioned Rodriguez and that no change in routine had occurred and no one was arming themselves. There was no justification for the rehiring of the two senior ATF raid commanders after they were fired. The fact that senior Clinton administration officials approved their rehiring indicates, in our judgment, a lack of sound judgment on their part. Uh, even the Treasury Department report states that raid commanders Winoski and Sarabin ap appeared to have engaged in a concerted effort to conceal their errors in judgment. The department, you must remember, settled a case the two had before the Merit Systems Protection Board. The Department of Treasury hired them back. The decision to fire these two individuals was more than justified. We have not received sufficient reason for their rehiring. It was very tough for me to make uh, this next conclusion. The decision by Attorney General Janet Reno to approve the FBI's plan to end the standoff on April 19th, again, in the committee's opinion, was premature. The Attorney General knew or should have known that the plan to end the standoff would endanger the lives of Davidians inside the residence, including the children. Let me tell you why we made this finding. The possibility of a peaceful end still existed. There was little risk to agents, society, or Davidians from continuing the standoff, which uh, Janet Reno knew or should have known if she had asked the right questions. In our judgment, she did not. And Reno should have known that the Davidians were likely to respond violently and perhaps with suicide to FBI efforts to force an end to the standoff. Following the FBI's April 19th assault on the Branch Davidian compound, Attorney General Reno offered her resignation. In light of her ultimate responsibility for the disastrous assault and its resulting deaths, including the deaths of 25 children, the President should have accepted it. We find Janet Reno to have seriously been negligent in her actions, and given this, President Clinton should have accepted her resignation when it was offered. FBI Tactical Commander Jeffrey Jamar and senior FBI and Justice Department officials advising the Attorney General knew or should have known that none of the reasons given to end negotiations and go forward with the plan to end the standoff on April 19th had merit. To urge this as an excuse to act was wrong and highly irresponsible. Jamar and senior FBI officials knew or should have known that the hostage rescue teams could have stayed on site for at least two or three more weeks. That no real threat of a breakout existed. 
The threat to the children from Koresh was no worse than February 28th, but a greater threat existed from forcing an end to the standoff, and that sanitary conditions, while stark, were not deteriorating. While it cannot be concluded with certainty, it is unlikely that the CS riot control agent in the quantities used by the FBI reached lethal toxic levels. This, the presented evidence does not indicate that the CS insertion in an enclosed bunker at a time when women and children, um, and let me go back, the presented evidence does indicate that the CS insertion into the enclosed bunker at a time when women and children were assembled inside that enclosed space could have been a proximate cause of, it, of or directly resulted in some or all of the deaths attributed to asphyxiation in the aut autopsy reports. In our final conclusion, and there's no evidence that the FBI intentionally or inadvertently set the fires on April 19th. No flame-throwing tanks were in evidence at Waco, and at the moment, and had the movement of FBI vehicles overturned a lighted lantern, the flare footage would have shown the fire beginning while the vehicle was touching or close to the residence. It does not show this. All three fires began when vehicles were not close to the residence. Now I'd like to address some of our key recommendations. Congress should consider moving jurisdiction over the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to the Department of Justice. This law enforcement uh, function is not a good fit, or doesn't appear to us to be a good fit, in a department that focuses on the economy. The lack of Treasury Department oversight in this case may indicate department-wide lack of involvement in law enforcement activities. A better fit, it seems to us, may be to move ATF to the executive branch department charged with law enforcement. If the false statement in the affidavits filed in support of the search and arrest warrants were made with knowledge of their falsity, criminal charges should be brought against the persons making those statements. As I mentioned before, and the report discusses in some detail, the affidavit in support of the warrants contained numerous errors. If this warrant statement was made with knowledge of the falsity of these statements, criminal charges should be brought against the person or persons who swore out the affidavit. The, affidavit, the ATF should be constrained from independently investigating drug-related drug crimes. ATF based part of its investigation of the Branch Davidians on unfounded, unfounded allegations that the Davidians were manufacturing illegal drugs. Evidence presented to the subcommittees points to the fact that ATF deliberately misled the military regarding the existence of a drug lab in the Davidian residence just to get free military assistance. Federal law enforcement agencies should take steps to foster greater understanding of the target under investigation. A great deal of specific expert information and advice was offered to the FBI from outside sources. The FBI did not accept this information. The Department of Justice arrogantly maintained that the FBI did not seek outside advice because they had the best advice in the world. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this changed at Montana, and my congratulations to, to them. That may be true in many cases, but the Bureau needs to be more open in our judgment, uh, open-minded to the opinions of experts outside of their employment. Federal law enforcement agencies should implement changes in training and operational procedures to provide better leadership in future negotiations. Testimony before the subcommittees revealed that the tactical team and the negotiation team would bring their opinion, should bring their opinions to the commander, and the commander would make the decisions. One of the problems at Waco was that Commander Jabbar, Jamar uh, could not decide which tactic he wanted to employ. Better training of these agents would force them to make better decisions at those critical times. The government should study further and analyze the effects of CS riot control agent on children and the elderly. The subcommittees recommend that CS not be used when children or persons with respiratory problems, pregnant women, and the elderly are present. Seems like common sense. There are few studies, very few studies, of the effects of CS on humans. The studies that do exist suggest that vulnerable people, such as the elderly, persons with breathing conditions, and children, may be more acutely affected by CS gas. Until more is known about the effects of long-term exposure to CS gas, the agent should only be used against those persons in most extreme circumstances. The government should continue to study the effects of CS gas on all its people. There are other findings and recommendations. I mentioned some of the key ones, but the bottom line is that this report was the first real independent review of the events that occurred at Waco.
It represents a tough year of review and a hard look at the facts, including the painstaking review of tens of thousands of new documents and transcript pages. We made some tough calls, but I believe that they are all accurate, well documented in this report, and all necessary. I know that the subcommittee will step up to the plate and hopefully will support this report. And I'm very proud of the report and I thank the staff for all their hard work. Uh, I do want to say that it was a privilege working with my colleague Bill McCollum and uh, with uh, the gentle lady uh, from Florida, Karen Thurman. Uh, again, when we started out, we promised the American people that we would give a full report of what happened and uh, recommendations uh, set to make sure that that same tragedy would not happen again. I now would like to yield to my good friend from Florida, Mrs. Thurman. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I thank the staff as well on both sides um, for their hard work and certainly for the 11 days that we spent in, in looking at this. Uh, this was not easy. Mr. Chairman, throughout the long days of last summer, I think that many of us approached the Waco hearings with an open mind. I know my mission throughout the hearing was never changed. I was determined to stick to the facts and find out what went wrong, however painful that might become. In spite of the fact that there were already numerous and self-critical reviews of the action of federal officials, I wanted to see if any substantial new information was out there. After 10 days, it was clear that there were not any major new facts about the tragedy at Waco. It was quite clear that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and the Federal Bureau of Investigation committed some very serious mistakes that may have contributed to the loss of life, a fact that I believe every member of the subcommittee acknowledged and at some point during the hearings. Now, almost a full year later, after the hearings have concluded, we are asked to consider a report that I have to tell you the minority had absolutely no role in producing. I want to make a few general remarks about the structure of the draft majority report. First, it is apparent that we do not have a complete copy of the report and that it has hastily prepared to accommodate the press. In reviewing the report, at least five appendices and various other attachments are referenced. We on the minority side do not have those materials. Second, while there are extensive footnotes, there are at least 10 instances of completely blank footnotes. Thus, the sources of information have not been identified to us. In addition, I was surprised to learn from the report that after the hearings concluded, majority staff conducted post-hearing investigations and interviews and issued requests for additional documents. Minority members and staff were neither informed of nor asked to participate in this phase of the investigation. To my knowledge, we have not received any documents the majority report claims to have obtained following the conclusion of the hearings. This is very troubling. Um, and I would request that you provide the minority with the information your staff collected during the stealth phase of the process. As to the substance in the report, my final impression, or my first impression, is the almost casual manner in which the majority report deals with the one person who is blamed for the tragedy at Waco, Vernon Howell, a.k.a. David Koresh. While the report does not escape the conclusion that Koresh was a criminal, it seems to contradict itself by failing to address the most riveting testimony over the entire course of the hearings. The brave 14-year-old Carrie Jewell who told the subcommittee just what kind of monster David Koresh was. The majority report blithely dismisses Koresh criminal and sickening behavior by stating that he could not be subjected to congressional oversight because he was not a federal official. I must also comment on the report's character characterization of former Treasury Secretary Lloyd Benson. The report ignores testimony and documentary evidence that the organizational structure and relationship between the Department of Treasury and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms allowed the BATF, BATF to exercise independence in planning and implementing of enforcement action. This relationship existed in previous administrations. Let us remember that the planning for the initial BATF raid in Waco began in the Bush administration. After the raid, Secretary Benson issued a, an order that altered that relationship and required the BATF to submit enforcement actions for review with the Treasury Department. Mr. Chairman, the agencies involved at Waco have learned their lessons without the benefit of this report and investigation. The recent events in Montana with the Freeman Group and in Arizona with the Viper Militia Group clearly demonstrates that the Department of Justice and the BATF learned from past mistakes and we were able to conclude both episodes without loss of life. 
I must confess, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I say this to you, I, I was somewhat surprised because I do believe that our respective groups tried to work together on this, that um, when you and Mr. McCollum actually held a press conference to release a summary of the report, um, you know, the press stories were already written, and quite honestly, at that time, the minority had not even seen what the press was being given, both through the original report and or the synopsis which the, um, the press was actually handed. Um, while I know it doesn't really break any of the rules, um, it certainly comes close to rule number four, which I think we all have tried to um, I think even in, in some conversation that took between Mr. Klinger and uh, Mrs. Collins in last week or the week before his committee hearing about this leaking issue. So we were taken somewhat back and, and surprised by the fact that, you know, it was given to the press, everything was done before we even had the opportunity to look at it. And I just kind of really wanted to put that on notice that I, that I, that once again, I thought we were working in cooperation and I would have expected that we would have at least had that opportunity to see the same thing the press did. Um, I will also save um, some other observations for our full committee business meeting on Thursday. Um, I, again, I really want to express my disappointment over I think how the process was handled and I sincerely regret that the minority was not consulted in the crafting of the report. It is the intention of this side of the aisle to file my minority views after the full committee meeting in accordance with committee rules. Hopefully these views will in some way, um, I think, give this uh, report a little bit more balance. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, uh, Mrs. Thurman. I, I do would like, you know, I, I think you and I discussed that day and I had hand delivered to your office a, a full report. I uh, tried to do very much. Uh, kind of after the press report, you well, have to admit. <laughs> uh, you mentioned leaking and you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, I think you're well familiar with the process and, and we tried very hard to um, get the report out and, uh, and certainly work with you uh, and others in terms of, I think, I mean, I, the, I get the feeling that, that generally overall it's a well done report. It's got your input because it's got 10 days of your input of hearings. And uh, we, I think we generally, in view of the massive effort with two subcommittees, uh, people on both sides of the aisle with strong feelings, we tried not to politicize it. We tried to downplay uh, the political aspects of it and try to really get to the issues to the American people of what went wrong and recommendations. And, and I, don't, I, I didn't hear you really quarrel with the recommendations we made, so I think generally we have a good report. Well, and I, as you and I both have noted, that many of those recommendations also were made through the oversight that BATF and the FBI did internally and, that's and within their outside. Sure. So you're exactly correct that while I don't disagree with some of the recommendations, I also believe that many of that was done in the reports, which, by the way, are not even given the opportunity in, you know, it, it, as appendices or right. anything of this nature within this bill to even show that they had done their own internal investigations. And in fact, um, both by what you've done in your report and by what they did prior to us even having the hearings uh, have in fact uh, come to some of the same conclusions. So I think that uh, that was one of the reasons why I think that's so I th important. I think the good thing is, is that as you and I sit back, a lot of our effort and resources went into this. I think we can feel good about the product. Uh, we may quibble about how we got there and the road that we traveled, but you know, in the end, I think we feel good about, number one, that uh, the agencies themselves have taken corrective action, uh, some of it which is probably directly related to the 10, 10 days of hearings that we had, and uh, whether, whether, you know, they didn't wait for us. And I think that's good. I think the American people have to feel good about that. Again, I use the example of Louis Free in Montana. Um, I think that that was a good, you know, outcome that, that uh, was taken advantage of a lot that was learned at, at Ruby Ridge and Waco. And, and, it, and it's a tribute to his leadership and the quality of the FBI. And I think in the end, their reputation is dependent on moving forward. And we want to be able to facilitate that. So I feel good about that. Matter of fact, um, I know we both had a chance to make statements. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I would ask unanimous consent to have all members' opening statements uh, included in the record. Um, if, if that's agreeable. 
Okay, without objection, so ordered. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, since uh, certainly we do feel proud of the end result, would you like to make the motion to accept the report? No, Mr. Chairman, I would not. Would anyone on your side of the aisle? Mr. Condit from California, good friend. Uh, thank you for that uh, setup. It's no, I, 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 would, I mean, I, can I make a comment, Mr. Chairman? Sure, I don't intend to make a motion. Uh, I do intend to support the report, but I do want to underscore what um, Ms. Thurman has said from Florida. Um, there is some disappointment over here that the, the, the press got this information before most of us got it on this side of the aisle. And also underscore, and, and I take this in the spirit that it's intended. I'm, I'm not trying to be overly critical, but that is... That is a problem for us because we all try to play by the same rules, and um, so that causes a, a bit of concern over here. The, the other part of this is um, in the report, and I frankly don't know why we couldn't support the report other than maybe uh, of the press concern, but the, the, is that the ATF and the FBI um, during the hearings indicated that they were going to do most of the things that ended up in the report. So. Uh, whether they came up with it, we came up with it, doesn't mean a whole lot to me. The fact is, is that we ought to be doing these things, and uh, okay. that's why I intend to do, uh, support the report. But uh, out of consideration for my ranking member over here, I would prefer someone on your side make, make the motion. Thank lady from New York. Oh, thank you. Just <laughs> want to give you the opportunity. Anybody on our side of the aisle? Like? Chairman, I will make the motion that we adopt the report by the subcommittee. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, call for the vote. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. And I think we ought to do this roll call. Okay, we'll have a roll call vote. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bellow? Aye. Mr. Ehrlich? Mr. Schiff? Aye. Mr. Ross Leighton? Aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Blute? Aye. Mr. Souter? Aye. Mr. Shattig? Aye. Mr. Klinger? Mrs. Thurman? No. Mr. Wise? Mr. Lantos? Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Condit? Aye. Mr. Brewster? Mr. Cummings? Mrs. Collins? Okay. Um, I believe that uh, we have a very strong consensus. Um, we, we also understand and take your constructive comments, and we thank you uh, again. Mr. Chairman, the uh, clerk has not reported, I believe, yet. Could you give us the total tally? Uh, Mr. Chairman, seven ayes and two nays. Okay. A motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Um, I believe we have a successful conclusion, and, uh, else? okay, the uh, subcommittee hearing is now adjourned. See, it's a good thing about having your brother. Oh, that's right, he left the... <laughs> okay, he's still